Good morning, I'm Holly. I'm a program manager at Edison Ford Winter States, and I'm excited about this month's digital discussion that's on Harvey Firestone, one of the great friends of Edison Ford, one of their travel companions, and one of the vagabonds. And right now I'm in front of his home, Harbell Villa in Miami. And let's get this webinar started. And I'm very thankful to you all for joining me. I'm going to move myself out of the way here. So it started with a handshake, the story of Harvey Firestone and his friendship with Thomas Edison and Henry Ford. And that handshake, as you'll find out, will be between Firestone and Ford. And that's Firestone, Ford and Edison, as you probably can tell in their later years. And Firestone is the youngest of the group. He's 21 years younger than Edison and 16 years younger than Ford. Harvey Samuel Firestone was born on December 20th, 1868 in Columbiana, Ohio. He was the middle son of Benjamin and Catherine Firestone. And Firestone's parents were farmers from an Alsatian family who settled in Ohio in 1807. He grew up on a family farm and attended a one room schoolhouse. He graduated from high school, then briefly enrolled in Ben Syrian Business College in Cleveland. He took a course, I believe, but he never graduated before working as a bookkeeper for a coal company. In the early 1880s, he worked as a salesman for his uncle, Clinton Firestone's Columbiana Buggy Company. And this home is the home that Harvey Firestone grew up in. And by the way, he never forgot his roots. And there's certainly things that he did he developed the park area that they've recently restored in Columbiana, Ohio. It's not a huge area, but that home, I think it was in 1983 that it was moved to Henry Ford's Greenfield Village. And you can visit the home of Harvey Fi that Harvey Firestone uh, grew up in. And I, I went to Greenfield Village. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to visit that. I'm very thankful to our CEO at the time that sent us to uh, that area. Um, and I would love to go back and see this. So I encourage you to go see Greenfield Village and to visit his home because I really think Harvey Firestone is, uh, under, uh, isn't well known enough. And this is Akron, Ohio, which is the area that Firestone's gonna settle in, in about 1906, I believe. Firestone established a rubber wheels company in Chicago in 1896. And with little money, he created a set of tires for his own buggy. While riding around one day on those new tires, he impressed a friend so much that they began discussing the idea of running their own shop, producing these rubber tires. They found a third partner and they raised the thousand dollars to to, that it, to open the shop uh, called the Rubber Tire Wheel Company. He sold the company in 1899 with a profit of all, all, over $41,000, which was a lot of, it's a lot of money today, but a lot of money at that time. With this money and a patent for attaching rubber tires to wheels, Firestone moved to Akron, Ohio, which was the center of the rubber tire manufacturing industry. He invested the money from the sale of the rubber tire company and established the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company in 1900 with just 17 employees. And I'm sure you're familiar with it. And you're probably thinking, well, what's the big deal? But I think we all know how important rubber is. And especially we really need those tires on our vehicles because we are a very mobile society dependent on that. And I hope that as I go along, you'll understand the importance of Firestone. He, um, he retained 50% ownership of the company. In his first year in business, Firestone Tire and Rubber sold $110,000 in tires for the first few years, Firestone had other companies manufacture his tires, and it didn't do as well. But in 1903, the company began to manufacture its own tires and improved its performance. His goal was to mass produce a tire that would reduce the jolt through the steering wheel. In 1920, tire sales reached 115 million. And I actually think this is when he first went to Akron, which would have been closer to 1900. Well, what about Ford and 
and Firestone. The relationship between Harvey Ford, Harvey Ford, Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone began with a cold call, which means no appointment and a handshake. Firestone, a carriage salesman came to Detroit from Ohio in 1897. So even before he had his own company on one of his regular visits, he called on Ford who was then working on horseless carriages and sold them a set of four wheels. Firestone had received some new pneumatic tires which were filled with air instead of solid rubber that were softer than the solid rubber tires Ford was looking to buy. And Ford orders a set of the pneumatics and he doesn't forget, of course there's Firestone. It was hard for me to find a picture when he was super young and starting out. So just got as close as I could. And this is his first Firestone store which leads to this. And there is Harvey Firestone and Edison, not at the near the end of their lives, but probably midway through. Um, they both had some things in common. They didn't like larger companies that held patents for producing tires and cars and then wanted royalties from them. So they, they all wanted to do their own manufacturing. They had a similar business philosophy. Henry Ford realized that, that the tires his company was producing and they were making their own tires at the time were inferior to those produced by Firestone. So Ford made Firestone Tire and Rubber Company his main supplier, remembering that earlier relationship when he got those tires. And I believe some sources say those tires were actually used on his quadricycle, the first vehicle he made by hand. In 1906, Ford produced 2,000 sets of Firestone tires at $55 a set. At that time, it was the largest single contract in the, for tires in the world. As the business relationship between Ford and Firestone grew, closer so did their friendship. And here you can see um, I'm going to guess this is when they were working on the rubber research project. Uh, this is probably on one of their camping trips or close to the time when they're talking about it. Um, obviously, something to do with tires. I will be honest, I did a lot of research to find out the exact moment when Firestone and Edison met. And I really couldn't find out, but uh, an article in the Smithsonian Magazine said that Firestone was introduced to Edison and John Burroughs, the naturalist, the other vagabond on the camping trips, was introduced to Edison by Henry Ford, which makes sense. But there was no moment I could find the exact day and time. But obviously they became friends as well as they're all gonna go on those camping trips together, which I had did a digital discussion on and talked about previously. And of course, Edison is very interested in rubber. I'll talk about that more later on, but not for the same reasons as Ford and Firestone. And this is a picture of Firestone in his later years. And obviously it was uh, used by somebody that was going to put it in something, maybe an exhibit. So you can see where the measurements are on here. But this was from the National Automotive History Collection. And it says a view of Harvey Firestone posing with the largest and smallest tires built by Firestone Tire and Rubber Company. The brick office building in the background printed on the front, 5334, um, Firestone will die in 38. Handwritten on the back, Harvey S. Firestone with the largest and smallest tires Firestone tire and rubber ever built. And a little bit more about Firestone in this business sense. Uh, Firestone factories were considered very efficient. Uh, his employees received medical and dental benefit services, free life insurance, and all the benefits of the Firestone Clubhouse. In 1915, a $350,000 building, think about it, the money of today, which is a heck of a lot more, was off that offered employees a restaurant, swimming pool, and a library. The company also purchased land nearby and helped workers build and finance their own homes. In 1916, Firestone was one of the first to introduce the eight-hour day in his Akron rubber factories, and he revised the pay scale so the employees earned as much in eight to ten, eight hours as they had in 10 or 12. And I'm by no means saying that he was perfect. Nobody is. And there's some things that will come up in his story later on. But overall, he seemed to be very advanced for the time, particularly in the rubber factory area. 
Okay, we're gonna move me up here. Uh oh, I went past that one. We'll go back. He offered a dismountable tire um, that allowed us, he actually made it possible, a dismountable rim, which permitted a spare to be substituted. And it became popular because of their use by automobile race winners. And Ford is, um, racers use their tires a lot. In 1911, Firestone began what would become a legendary involvement in car racing by entering and winning the first Indianapolis 500. Not him personally, but their tires. And a lot of the drivers would use those. And this continued on for many, many years. I didn't go in depth to this, but that was something that they were noted for. Firestone also joined America's Good Roads Movement, supporting the Lincoln Highway, which was a coast to coast uh, highway and Route 66. He also creates the ship by truck campaign, encouraging manufacturers to move their products to market by truck. And the first coast to coast truck shipments of goods traveled on Firestone tires. In 1913, the company's annual sales were $15 million. Firestone, Goodyear, Goodrich, United States Rubber and Fist were the big five. And some of those were there before Firestone was. In 1920, to 21, the depression left the company with a $43 million debt. Firestone cut prices, increased sales, paid off the debt. And I do believe he might've had to lay off some employees at that time or decided that he need to. And he did pay off the debt by 1924. And in 1923, Firestone introduced the balloon tire soon to become the standard for most types of motor vehicles. So he was a leader in the field. And Firestone made it through the 1929 depression without suspending dividend payments. And this is an old ad. I think it was probably uh, not during the time maybe that even Firestone was alive, but it says Firestone dealers everywhere are profiting from the skate contribution to motoring safety, dependability and mileage. Also in the new Firestone sales plan, a method of merchandising that offers Unusual advantages to tire dealers in the development of a large successful business through one-stop service stations. You'll be interested in full particulars. Right Firestone Tire and Rubber Company, Akron, Ohio, Los Angeles, California. And you like the horse in the ad there? And I, this is my favorite part. Write them, send them a letter. Hmm. This isn't Harvey Firestone. I'm jumping ahead a little bit because I wanted to talk about the business before I talked about the family part. And this is Harvey Firestone Jr. And this is where we get into some things that are a little more controversial. Harvey S. Firestone Jr. and President King of Liberia on the veranda of the executive mansion. From 1922 to 1924, the price of rubber became a problem for the tire and automobile industries. Great Britain controlled the majority of the world's rubber supply. They had rubber seeds and it restricted rubber production to drive up prices. As part of a Department of Commerce subsidized worldwide search for a place for rubber plantations, Firestone sent experts to Liberia in December of 1923 to do a soil survey. And if my husband was here, I could tell you much more about Liberia, but it was an area considered that freed slaves could go. Um, I think it rather had a utopian view that was not very successful. And by this, let's just say that I don't believe sending people that were freed slaves from the United States unless they, I, I, that was not appropriate. I won't go on about that anymore, but I will talk about this. Firestone sends experts there to, in 1923 to do that survey. And in 1926, the Liberian government granted Firestone a 99 year lease for a million acres at six cents an acre, which even then was a very small amount of money. And he established rubber tree plantations of the South American rubber tree, Avea. I wish Debbie Hughes, the horticulturist here, Brazilian S is in the country. I didn't say that right, but you got the idea. And it's not native to Liberia. It's native to South America in the country. Rubber tree, basically, eventually creating the world's largest rubber plantation. 
there's some problems here. It's a corrupt government. Uh, people were put into situations over the years, and this is more like in the 40s and 50s even, but it starts even starts out that way, but it continues years of forced labor, racism, and other things go on, corrupt government. It is still controversial today. Today, Firestone is now Bridgestone. They still, it's a smaller plantation. I think they pay 50 something cents an acre but it's not without controversy, but that is where a great amount of rubber comes from. And they're, they are on the veranda. And now we'll go on to the family things. In 19, at, eight, at 21, Ida Bell Smith married an unemployed buggy salesman and there she is, she's lovely. The dress sleeves are, I, I picked this particular picture. There wasn't a lot of her. Um, as a younger woman, but the sleeves are something pretty special. Uh, but she uh, is a very accomplished woman. She marries this unemployed buggy salesman named Harvey Firestone on November 20th, 1895. She was a composer and songwriter, educated at Alma College in Ontario, Ohio. She joined the American Society of Composers in 1948, and her popular song compositions include, and you probably haven't heard of these, but they were popular at the time, if I could tell you. And that was the theme of the radio and television Voice of Firestone programs. In my garden, you are the song in my heart. And do you recall Melody of Love and Bluebirds? The Voice of Firestone began as a radio broadcast on NBC Radio on December 3rd, 1928. It made history by becoming one of the first places to simulcast both on radio and television. And the Voice of Firestone television program continued to air on NBC until 1959, when due to scheduling conflicts, the show's producers chose to end their contract and sign with ABC. The radio broadcast ended in 1956, but the television broadcast continued to 1963. And so she was an accomplished woman as her own right, though um, when she gets married and has children, her focus tends to be more on them. Uh, what I'm talking about actually is mostly when Mr. Firestone had passed away. Uh, this is a picture of some of the Firestone children. Uh, this is Russell on the left. His nickname was Bud. Harvey Firestone. The little girl there who is so cute is Elizabeth. And there is Ida Bell Firestone and next to her is Harvey. He's a naval aviator in World War I, 1917. And he will run the company as several of them will. They all work in the business. Harvey and Ida Bell had five sons who lived to adulthood. Harvey S. Jr. You see there, Russell Allen, Leonard Kimball, Raymond Christian and Roger Stanley. And they all worked in the family business. Harry Firestone, I could not find much about him except he seemed, I think it was 1897. He, born, he was born and died in the same year. So he died in infancy, which is a tragedy for any family. And their daughter, Elizabeth Idabel Firestone, and I'll talk more about her later, died in 1941 at the age of 26 after her father, but her mother was still alive. So she had to go through losing uh, two children. I like this picture of the uh, four of uh, him with four of his sons, and I guess they clearly look like they have been playing polo. That says that in 1929, uh, but clearly Harvey was not playing polo. Uh, so those boys were brought up in a very different, had a very different upbringing than Harvey said had as far as fin financial um, matters. This is the part that makes me a little sad. There's no Firestone home today, but I'm going to show you pictures. This is actually an old colorized postcard. It says the it's cut off. It says Harvey S. Firestone Residence and Italian Gardens in Akron, Ohio. And Harbell Manor was the 118 room home of Harvey Firestone, his wife Ida Bell, and their six children. Harbell, or Harvey and Ida Bell, was a combination of the owner's first names. He, Harvey bought 60 acres of farmland in 1907 and hired the Akron architectural firm Harpster and Bliss to design three-story mansion 
which was built in 1912. Over the years, a gatehouse was added along with servants' homes and an indoor swimming pool. And you can see the outdoor one there. The estate grew to 100 acres, including a barn, stables, polo grounds, orchids, and gardens. Sounds like an amazing place. And this is in Ohio. We'll talk about Miami later. The Firestones had 75 horses. They really are into horseback riding. Well, the sons are polo players, but Harvey always seems to appreciate riding. There's a picture of him with his daughter, Elizabeth, when she's about 16. And they're both on horseback. There's a barn, stables, polo grounds, orchids, gardens, 75 horses, 125 cattle. I think I repeated myself, but it's so impressive. 5,000 chickens and 40 sheep. They sold 39 acres to the Portage Country Club. And then the Firestone family later sold Harbell Manor to developers in 1959, nearly five years after Ida Firestone's death. So Firestone dies in 1938 and Ida Bell dies in 1954. So about 16 years later. Um, Twin Oaks Estate Development bought the remaining 65 acre estate and they subdivided it into 45 residential lots and the mansion was torn down, which I found a very disappointing. It looked like it was grand and it's not there anymore. And I'm very fortunate Edison Ford Winter Estates has a large property combining the estates here in Florida of Edison and Ford. It has some land, not as much as that, nor is it of the same design, but it's a place that people can go and hear their story. And you can hear about the Firestone family at Greenfield Village, but I always want so much more. And so many people, by the way, think he lived here in Fort Myers. We'll address where he lived in Florida. So this is his Miami home here. I'm blocking it a little bit, but from 1923 until Harvey's death in 1938, the Firestones frequently stayed in their winter home in Miami Beach on a large piece of land with 1,600 feet of ocean front. It was purchased from a man named James Snowden who built it in 1916. The Firestone Estate was the premier home on Miami Beach's Millionaire's Row. And other places I've read it was called Tin Can Alley and some people got a little, hmm, thought that it maybe it wasn't quite as refined as uh, people with that wealth acquired from the automobile tire industry, but I don't believe that's true. It's a beautiful home. It had a dining room ceiling salvaged from a home by Stanford White, who was a famous architect, and I even believe he might have done some art. The estate consisted of the residence, a lodge house, large garage with living quarters, a playhouse for children, swimming pools, sunken gardens. The house had 10 bedrooms on the second floor while the ground floor contained reception, living room, billiard rooms, library, dining room, and servants apart. The grounds were surrounded by a stone wall with ornamental iron gates. And I wish I had some better pictures of both of these. But Firestone was experimenting with new latex plant sources of latex on the piece of land across Indian Creek, which is across from the mansion, which I didn't know before. I knew that of Liberia, I knew Ford in Brazil. I knew Ford grew some things in La Belle. Of course, Edison in Fort Myers, finding that source of rubber. But I never knew the Firestone grew some experimental plants across the river from his mansion. Thomas Edison was also conducting rubber research in his Fort Myers lab, and he often visited Firestone. I don't know, and his experimental rubber garden to compare notes. And there's several places that have documentation when he comes over to speak with Firestone about that. And, and for some reason, I guess I wasn't completely aware. Of course, I knew he was interested in rubber, but that he was growing some as well. After Firestone's death, the house served as a quite luxurious officer's quarters during World War II. I'd love to I'm going to do more information about that, discover some someday. And it served as a construction headquarters for the Fountain Blue Hotel in 1954, which was being built around it until the house itself was torn down to make room for the hotel's formal gardens and pool. And that was a bummer. There it is there, the home. 
there is what the fountain blue, the homes torn down. It's still a beautiful hotel today, but I'm sorry that we lost the Firestone. Harbell Villa, I believe is what it's called. And I even think the rubber plantation in Liberia is um, Harbell Rubber Plantation or Harbell Plantation. All right, here we're talking about rubber. Between 1915 and 1924, Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, Harvey Firestone, and John Burroughs, the Vagabonds, went on summer camping trips. And then later in the years, this is them on one of their camping trips, Ford, Edison, Firestone. And I, if you go to YouTube and you put in Edison Ford Digital Discussions, I have one on their camping trips. And it's called On the Road Again. And they talk about their rubber research on their camping trips. And they originally they go and meet up with Luther Burbank, who does some research in that area as well. And this is one of um, the area that focuses um, on the, the camping trips. And certainly one of the, the rubber re research is discussed there as well. Um, and Firestone's role on those camping trips I found interesting, at least according to the book, The Vagabonds, what I should have listed in my bibliography. But a lot of times he took a lesser role. He arranged for the trip. Um, he made sure that Edison first and then Fires, um, Ford were definitely happy. He was close to them, but he always kind of took a back seat as well. And they did have some in-depth discussions. He is great friends with President Warren G. Harding who joins them on one of the trips. Anyway, if you haven't visited Edison Ford Winter Estates and seen our laboratory and that Into the Wild exhibit, which is a, a panoramic shot that I took, that's kind of so-so, but I hope it whets your appetite for coming here. And here is a picture of Ford Edison. There's President Warren G. Hardy, and uh, I'm just reading a bibliography about him right now. A very fascinating man. Uh, this author has a little different viewpoint of him. So uh, check it out and do a little more research. And there's Firestone, always ready to help, to organize things. And later on, in later years, their families, their wives would come along as well on these trips. And here's a picture inside our rubber research or our botanical laboratory. The original one that we had is an electric lab. You can go visit in Greenfield Village. Supposedly it has Fort Myers soil underneath it. This lab is very similar. It has been elevated. And in 1927, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone were concerned about America's dependence on foreign rubber sources for its industrial enterprises. The three men formed the Edison Botanic Research Corporation and the following year built the laboratory, which came the rubber research projects headquarters. He had fields of goldenrod and other things. He had tested 17,000 different types of plants to get the best source of rubber. And he just didn't, they didn't miraculously all become interested in rubber. They became interested a few years before that. In the event of a war, another national emergency Edison wanted to be prepared and he wanted to have that alternative source and preferably a quick growing crop. But does our banyan tree try and tie into that as a rubber source? Most definitely. Uh, so they do form that. They each uh, supposedly put in, they each put in $25,000. They form that corporation. Edison dies in 1931. They do make rubber from a source that's known as goldenrod. It's successful, but not necessarily practical. Come visit the lab and find out more about that and come visit us and find out more and go to Greenfield Village and visit the Firestone home. And someday I hope there's something even more out there for Harvey Firestone. So many people think he lived here in Fort Myers. He visited, he's a partner in the Edison Botanic Research Corporation, but he never lived here in Fort Myers. Um, this is Firestone near the end of his life. This is from a Bridgestone Firestone site. And I love him in the overalls there. I mean, he was born on a farm. He is a farm guy. There's pictures of him in tractors, riding horses. I don't think he ever forgot his uh, roots. And he dies February 8th, 1938. He dies of a coronary thrombosis at the age of 69 in his Miami home. 
that's her Belle Villa. And that was not expected. And there is, I, these oil paintings that I uh, put in here of them. This is Mrs. Harvey Firestone. That's back when they called them people by those names, their, their husband's name as well, Ida Bell Smith. That's done in 1932. Uh, Harvey's done in 1932 as well. It all started with their daughter-in-law, uh, the wife, of Harvey Firestone Jr. Here she is. And this is Mrs. Harvey Samuel Firestone Elizabeth Park in 1928. It's an oil on canvas by DeLaslo, um, 1928. It says Paris. And there is Harvey Firestone Jr. from 1931. Remember, they have five children five sons and a daughter that uh, lived to adulthood. So I don't have pictures of all of them, but I wanted you to get a feel for succeeding generations. And here's a couple of their children. Elizabeth Chambers Firestone, 1932. I think she's about 10 to 12 years old here. She, when she marries, she becomes known as Mrs. Charles Wills Firestone. Charles Wills, she's the Firestone, Elizabeth Chambers Firestone. And this is Mrs. William Clay Ford as a child, Martha Park Firestone. They are both the children of Harvey Firestone Jr. and painted by the same artist in 1932. And this one just, I found heartbreaking. And this is their daughter at about the age of 16. Mrs. Raymond Graham, Elizabeth Idabel Firestone. Daughter of the late Harvey Firestone, founder of Firestone Tires and Rubber, died of streptococcus infection last night in a local hospital. Mrs. Graham, the former Miss Elizabeth Firestone, was the wife of Ray Austin Graham, an official of the National Defense Commission. With her at the time of her death was her brother, Harvey Firestone, junior vice president of the rubber company and some other members of the family. She was taken ill on Monday. The Grahams who have one infant child lived at nearby McLean, Virginia. She was 26, attended a high school and she graduated from Smith College in 1938 after her marriage. September, she lived in Charlottesville, Virginia, where her husband did graduate work and funeral services will be held at the Firestone family home. Besides her husband and mother, she's survived by her son and her five brothers. She was a very young woman. She's 26 years old. Harvey had passed away, but Mrs. Firestone was still alive. Uh, it's a tragedy, streptococcus, uh, which people could still die of it today, but uh, a little more unusual, uh, and it's a tragedy. So this is her at 16, and she lives to about 26 years old. And this is Ida Bell, Mrs. Firestone, who lives about 16 years younger, uh, 16 years longer, excuse me. And she's a woman who at 21 found herself married to an unemployed buggy salesman. You notice I talked about that. She was the widow of the founder of Firestone Tires. That's so small on the screen, you can't see it. But in adversity or plenty, the Firestone home was a place of serenity and grace, reflecting the char characteristic of its gentle mistress. At 75, Mrs. Firestone told an interview, I think we should all make the best possible job of our life's work, whatever it may be. Mine has been that of a homemaker. They've been married five years when they moved to Akron, Ohio. Mrs. Firestone was 26, her husband 31, and they had an infant son, Harvey Firestone Jr. He was no means broke, but you know his story. He builds his company from the ground up. For 10 years, the Firestones lived in a $40 a month rented house. And it goes on to tell their story and then the in the teens, the Firestones build the house of their dreams, Harbell Manor. 
Yet Firestone in his book, Men of Rubber, which I did read, thanks, um, thankfully, uh, held that the house was much bigger than he needed. In most cases, he said, and especially with men who have earned their own money, the house is just built and when it's done, no one quite knows why it was ever started. She studied music and I told you she was a composer and how she was involved with the Firestone uh, Hour. And so she goes on to live many years after her husband and has the tragedy of losing her daughter. So she didn't have a career uh, until later years. Her focus was her family. And uh, from what I've read, I read uh, Uncommon Friends by James Newton, who wrote it at the end of his life. So there's some little things here and there that a couple of dates might be off, but he talks about the Firestones and he talks very fondly of Mrs. Firestone as well, um, it being a very positive experience and they being a remarkable family. And he has a great friendship with the son, Russell Firestone. And there's a lovely picture of Mrs. Firestone. And this is an Ohio um, historic marker that was put up about 20 years ago. Harvey S. Firestone, inventor, industrialist, and philanthropist. And he did donate. I didn't, I think I didn't emphasize that enough to a number of charitable organizations. He was born on a nearby farm and attended school in Columbiana. He founded the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company in 1900 and soon after developed a method for mass producing tires for the infant automobile industry, continuing innovation and steady contracts with the large automobile automakers led to the company's lasting success. Firestone Park is his lasting legacy to Columbiana. He never forgot his hometown. The Firestone family's monument is located nearby Columbiana Cemetery. Oh, and it's put up by the Longerberger Company who no longer exists. Um, let me go, I guess I really should have gone back and said something, but I will tell you that in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, Firestone was having financial difficulty and yes, the sons are involved and they had sold, they ran it for a while. Uh, it does reach, uh, go into some extremely difficult times and is eventually sold to a Japanese co company and it becomes part of Bridgestone, which today is why it's known as Firestone, Bridgestone, and uh, it's kind of a little sad that there's really not Firestone anymore, but that is what happened to the company. But because we're focusing on Harvey, I didn't go into that great depth, but I did want to touch on one more family story. And this is the wedding of Martha Firestone, who's right here, and her husband, future husband, uh, he was her husband on that day, William Clay Ford. He's the son of Edsel Ford, obviously, the grandson of Henry Ford. And they met at a lunch. So we got a Firestone and a Ford at a, in New York, arranged and tended by both of their mothers. Uh, she was a student at Vassar, and he was a naval cadet at St. Mary's U.S. Navy Pre-Flight School. They married on June 21st, 1947 at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Akron, Ohio, on March 9th, 2014, Martha's husband, William, died at the age of 88. Uh, he had been involved in Ford Motor Company. He had been the sole owner of the Detroit Lions. Uh, we're not going to talk about their ups and downs, we're just, um, but he does own the company. I believe they were married for 67 years or close to it. He died at the age of 88 and his controlling interest passes to her. She's then the majority owner of the team with each of her four children holding small shares in the team. And there's a few women that are the owners of football teams. And I say, keep it up. Let's have that happen some more and maybe some baseball teams as well. Uh, she And I she stepped down as the Lions owner uh, on June 23rd, to. 2020 to be succeeded by her daughter Sheila Hemp Ford, and by the way, there um, there are other descendants of the Ford Firestone family, a number of them. So she is running the Detroit Lions football team today. And Harvey and Ida Bell are buried, and some of their children are buried here in Akron, Ohio. And I, I'm. A, Embarrassed to say I've never been to Akron. Um, 
one of our historians, Maxine, lives there, but I think it's worth a visit. And I would certainly pay a tribute to the man that really did a lot for rubber in the tire industry and was a good friend to Edison and Ford. And I like these quotes from by Firestone. You get the best out of others when you get the best out of yourself. And this one, this was at a, I think it was a commencement address. There are three things that are absolutely necessary to real success in life. They are service, sacrifice, and unselfishness. You will get out of life just what you put in it in the way of service. And that's, that's a pretty uh, solid philosophy, I would say. And here's my email, and I'm going to show you my sources, and I just want to talk a little bit more about Firestone. This is uh, Schaefer at edisonford.org. I welcome your questions, uh, your suggestions for future programs, if you think it's worthwhile continuing this every month. And here is our address. If you ever want to send anything to us, donations are welcome, not required. Um, and next month on May 10th at 1030, I'm talking about baseball and the Civil War, and you're going to say, not interested in baseball or the Civil War, but you should be because it's part of our American history. So much was going on, the two tied together. I'll talk about them in camps, when they are held as prisoners of war, how baseball affects the game, how it affects the state of the world. Yes, I'm passionate about uh, baseball. I don't think you could say I'm, I'm very interested in the Civil War and about US history. And that's the time when Thomas Edison is a teenager. I hope you'll join me It's something I think you'll find interesting. Uh, and here's my resources. Uh, I, there are a couple of biographies I believe out there. Um, the interlibrary loans didn't come in in time. I did do a lot of research. Um, when there was conflicting information, I used the one that was most common and, and then fit the narrative the most. I, I didn't put all the books about Edison and Ford I've read in here, but there's some of them, Find the Grave. There's a book about Firestone, A Legend of Celebration, the Florida Memory Project. There's, there's so much information. The book Men and Rubber that Firestone writes that more focuses on uh, rubber industry. Uh, certainly the camping trips with Edison and Ford are on there. Miami Curve, oh, they're uncommon friends. There's so many things. Uh, I tend to get wrapped up in my research. It's harder for me to put this on paper. So I've got some chats up here. Let's take a look and see what they are. Um, interestingly, Car from Carol, the factory and the country club is now in Summit Con county interesting perhaps they redrew the county lines at some point designated as portage county the neighboring county where i grew up seems a quandary my dad worked at firestone tire and rubber in the 1950s and i will see if i can do more in, uh, research on that thank you absolutely look forward thank you Anne. to future Digital discussions, thank you. Nice work, Holly. Oh, thank you from my husband, better and better each time. And Paul Huffman, just moved here. This was my first time attending, thank you. I hope you'll join me again, come visit. Really, I truly welcome your suggestions, your feedback, the information Carol uh, gave was really interesting. Dan, thanks, Holly, please keep these coming. And Firestone also introduced rubber tires for farm tractors, and I should have put that in there. Dan is uh, one of our volunteers in a font of knowledge in the early 30s and remains a tire manufacturer, super research. Thank you, you're all so very kind. So guess what? That's it for this month. I wanna see you next month, invite your friends. And Margaret, thank you, saying um, awesome. Uh, Maxine, my Ohio friend and historian loved your information. And boy, we all need to get to Akron. There's a lot of history there. And I don't think I've appreciated the tire industry as much as I do now. Uh, please join me next month. I appreciate you so much. Invite other people. And remember, go to Edison Ford uh, YouTube Digital Discussion. There's the digital discussions I've done and the ones Adam's done. And thanks for joining me. It's fun that you can see it later, but I love having your feedback and you here. 
thank you. I'm going to end it for now, and I will plan on seeing you next month. And Kristen, thank you. Love this visit the estate a few times. It's nice to keep in touch with history. Thank you all. See you next month. Bye-bye.